Well, I see it. we're at the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Becky Miles Polka, and I'm a senior consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, and we're thrilled about today's webinar. Uh, we have um, over 500 people who have registered for the webinar, the largest since uh, we've started GLR Learning Tuesdays. Uh, so that, I think, says a lot about this topic. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started with our presentations. Um, please use the chat function uh, over the course of the webinar and you can start by um, telling us your name and introducing yourself and uh, which community you're from. Um, and then as our speakers present, um, feel free to put questions in the chat box. We will hold Q&A until all of the speakers have finished today, so that will be closer to um, the top of the hour. Um, we are recording the webinar today, and a link to this recording will be sent to you, uh, to everyone who's registered. And we will have a brief survey at the end of the webinar today, so please stay on uh, until that survey is up, because we'd love to get your feedback. Um, as you can see, we have uh, 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 some exciting sessions planned over the next few weeks, and we have completed 10 of these GLR Learning Tuesdays since we started in September. Um, we think that having this regular time every Tuesday starting at 3 Eastern will allow you the opportunity to get it on your calendar and participate uh, with us. You can find, uh, you can get access to all of these previous webinars on our CLIP um, learning platform if you need help connecting to that, we can certainly get you connected. So please save the date and time for um, those things that are coming up soon. So I'm especially thrilled um, to be part of today's webinar. It's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, um, and that is leveraging the critical role that health providers play in children's healthy development and early literacy. And we know that this relationship with primary health care providers is one of the most trusted in early childhood. We have some really special presenters today and a very full agenda. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian Gallagher, who's the hey, CEO of really? And he's going to share more about, um, about our, our panelists today. Brian? Great, Becky. Thank you so much. Um, and to the Campaign for Grade Level Reading team, um, it's an honor to be here with you all today um, to talk about our work, but also to uh, just acknowledge the partnership that we have with the campaign that we've had for many years um, and a lot of local connections that have been developed over those years, which we'll hear um, uh, some about in a little bit. Um, but I think this moment in time certainly is an opportunity for us to deepen that partnership um, and really think about you know, the, way, the ways in which we align our work um, with not just the campaign, but the communities uh, throughout the country um, within that campaign. Um, this is also a great opportunity for us to um, certainly tell the Reach Out and Read story, um, but more importantly, talk about how uh, the partnerships that we can have locally uh, really get to that collective impact that we're all interested in and focused on um, in terms of seeing that impact with those children and families that we're serving every day. Um, many Many of you may know about Reach Out and Read, and if uh, for those of you who know um, just a little bit, you'll certainly know more um, in the next 90 minutes. Um, one of the reasons that this opportunity today to um, for this convening is that 2019 marks the 30th anniversary of Reach Out and Read, um, which grew from one site at Boston City Hospital, now Boston Medical Center, um, by pediatricians. Um, and grew very organically over the past uh, three decades. Um, so this being our 30th anniversary, we have taken a step back to celebrate some of our, um, our key milestones, but more importantly, um, plan for the future of the next 30 years of uh, physician engagement um, around parent-child interactions, how literacy can be a part of that. Um, and we've called our strategy the next chapter um, strategy, which you'll hear more about um, in a little bit. Um, but there are really two components of that. One is um, 
our, our desire and our interest and the need really to focus on uh, increasing the quality of our program um, across the network, um, but also reaching more children and families, um, training more providers, um, ensuring that we really leverage the pediatric platform in a way that um, allows us to have that universal access that we know we can have and, and achieve that potential. Um, the second component really is a new component for us, um, and that is, in addition to focusing on our core program, how do we amplify the impact um, that we can have through uh, strategic collaborations um, at the local level, at the national level, at the regional level, um, because we know that no single program um, can have that impact that we want um, alone. Um, we took a, a big step this month, about a month ago, um, earlier in, in November, um, where we convened what we called our Next Chapter Forum. Uh, it was the first time that we had brought together um, uh, a component of funders, um, partners, medical leadership, uh, reach out and read representation, policy advisors, um, to really begin a conversation around this idea of leveraging the pediatric platform, um, thinking about Reach Out and Read not just as a program that operates um, through well child visits, but as a platform given the, the scale that we've been able to achieve um, in all 50 states, um, and how can we work with other organizations, other initiatives, um, to partner in a way that gets us um, a deeper impact in, in um, with, with children and families. Um, so you'll hear a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. Um, I'm honored and delighted to introduce um, three of my colleagues um, today who you'll be hearing from. Um, we're gonna start off with um, two of our uh, physician champions, medical leaders, um, Dr. Depeshna Avsaria and Dr. Nathan Ch Chomolo. Um, and then after they speak, I'll introduce um, Carolyn Merrifield from um, Reach Out and Read Carolinas. But to start, I'll uh, introduce uh, Dr. Navsaria and Dr. Chomolo. Uh, Dr. Depeshna Navsaria is a pediatrician working in the public interest. He blends the roles of physician, occasional children librarian, educator, public health professional, and child health advocate. With graduate degrees in public health, children's librarianship, physician assistant studies and medicine, he brings a unique combination of interests and experience together. An associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and director of the MD-MPH program there, Dr. Nazaria is also the medical director of the physician assistant program. Clinically, he has practiced primary care pediatrics with special interest in underserved populations. He's the founding medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin. Dr. Navsaria is heavily involved in both training and in the practice of child health advocacy, writing and speaking publicly, locally, regionally, and nationally on early brain and child development, early literacy, and advocacy to broad variety of audiences. He also has extensive network uh, involvement with the American Academy of Pediatrics at the state and national levels. Committed to understanding how basic science can translate into busy primary care settings via population health concepts and policy initiatives, Dr. Navsaria aims to educate the next generation of those who work with children and families in realizing how their professional roles include being involved in larger concepts of social policy and how they may affect the cognitive and social emotional development of children for their future benefit. Dr. Nate Chomolo practices as a pediatrician and internal medicine hospitalist with Park Nicolette Health Services Health Partners in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He received a zoology degree from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and graduated from the University of Minnesota Medical School. He's a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Early Childhood and Section on Minority Health, Equity, and Inclusion. Currently serves as the medical director for Reach and Read Minnesota is an adjunct assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical School, has been appointed to the Minnesota Governor's Early Learning Council and helped start the organization Minnesota Doctors for Health Equity, where he serves as the vice president. So with that, I will uh, pass the microphone over to Dr. Navsaria. Great, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, really appreciate being here and appreciate everyone's um, uh, time to be able to uh, do so, uh, to take time out of their day to be able to work with us today. Um, 
to my CGLR colleagues. It is not allowing me to share while you are currently sharing. So I think you may need to de-share to in order for me to be able to share my screen. Great. Let me get that going here. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So um, again, really a delight to be here and uh, watching the name everyone in a number of watching the names of watching everyone's names go by uh, and the affiliations that you have is really a delight because it does remind me that uh, we all care uh, collectively about the same thing, which is the well-being of children and family. Uh, that we serve no matter what. So I want to spend some time kind of setting up the frame for really a, a common issue that I think we all face uh, in terms of working with children and families and making sure that they can flourish and thrive and reach their full potential, which is really about early brain development uh, in children and how we can best foster and nurture that um, in, in, in the work that we do, no matter how we may approach things. So um, I'll start off by um, saying that, you know, this a three-legged stool for developmental and health trajectories in children. Uh, one of the legs of the stool, so to speak, is what we talk about all the time in medicine, all those biological factors that really make a key difference for, um, for children as they grow up. But we kind of came to realize it wasn't simply just those biological factors, that another piece of it was the socioeconomic environment, that the zip code a child is born and brought up in matters more than their genetic code uh, when it comes to their long-term long -term outcomes. And I'll remind everyone that, of course, that's a man-made construct, which means that we as human beings can change that. Uh, it's not destiny that zip code matters. It's because of things that we can and should try to change. But then we realized it wasn't just these broader socioeconomic environments that mattered. It was also the attachment and relationship patterns. Who's at home? Who's in their neighborhoods? Who's around them? who's in their early childhood centers, and how are those um, folks interacting with uh, children every day? And that really helped us realize that that was a th the third key part of the stool, so to speak. And that brings me to the next point, that if you look at the architecture of the developing brain, what are the two things that influence how those neurons connect and wire to one another? One is your genes. You need a template, so to speak, of how those neurons actually should and shouldn't connect. But you also need experiences to decide which neurons are the ones that actually make, uh, make the connections and which don't. Do we want a brain that's wiring for love, for learning, for curiosity, for engagement with the world? Or do we want a brain that's wiring for safety, for fear, for kind of self-protection and defense? So experiences matter. We, we don't have time to get into the, the changing of genes. But we can talk about experiences, and I want to highlight you need both those things, genes and experiences. It's like a campfire. You need wood and you need the spark in order to get that campfire going. You can't have one without the other. And then if you asked, how do we mold experiences? How do we change those? Well, it's through the advice we give, it's through the programs we set up, and it's through the policies that we enact. And then if you said, okay, but what's the number one thing that we should have a laser focus on, the most important thing that matters most of all? It's what we call serve and return engagement in relationships with loving, nurturing adults in the child's environment. That serve and return is like in tennis when you serve that ball to your partner and they volley it back. That back and forth that happens when children engage in these relationships with loving, nurturing adults is what drives development. In fact, in young children, in kids under age two or three, it's the only thing that drives development. There's no toy, there's no TV show, there's no app that drives development just on its own. You can't just put a child in front of those things. It's the adult that matters. The adult is what, what makes the biggest difference. As one of my colleagues once said, there is no app to replace your lap. So we need to make sure families are hearing this message and we should use this idea to drive everything that we do when we think about how we approach children and families. Are we building, protecting, and promoting the existence of these strong, loving, nurturing relationships? And are we doing it early in life? And that's really key is to recognize this, this element of, of what's going on early in life. Because human brain development is going so quickly in that first part of life 
the middle part of this graph where the, it says sensory pathways and language, that's the first year of life right there. And then after that is the rest of childhood. So much about vision, hearing, language, those synapses are forming early on. And yes, there's a lot of fine tuning that goes on after that, but so much of it is happening early. There are 700 new neural connections per second happening in the developing brain. And that is, we want those neurons to happen well. And the brain never wires again with quite that same frequency. There's also this idea of brain plasticity. There's two main types, synaptic and cellular. And, and don't really worry about what they mean because the key is actually in the third line that's appearing here in a moment, that synaptic plasticity is lifelong. We are all using synaptic plasticity to learn. But cellular plasticity is already declining by age five. Yes, those kindergartners are kind of over the hill in at least one way already. So this diminishing cellular plasticity limits your ability to do good remediation later on. It's not that it's impossible. We still, still have the synaptic plasticity to work on, but it's much harder. This is why we don't wait to fix speech delay until a child is eight, right? It's so much easier at age three than it is at eight and so much better. And it's even easier at 18 months than it is at, um, uh, at, at age three and so on. So this is a biological fact. So this is why early investment, early intervention, early action really makes such a key difference. We also know that brain architecture and abilities are built from the bottom up. Sometimes folks have this odd idea that, that these things are simple and easy. Well, they're not simple or easy for a developing child. They need to master some of these relatively simple tasks in order to be able to do more complex things later on. So when people say things like, why are we putting money into this program? These kids are just playing. Well, that's a profound misunderstanding of what play actually means for children. As many, including T. Barry Brazelton, have said, play is the work of infancy. The child's job is to play because that's how they explore and build out their developmental skills and abilities over time and be able to do more complex things later on. I'd like to take just a few moments to talk about stress in our environment. So we often think about stress as being a bad thing or a negative thing. And certainly too much of it, as you'll see, is not a good thing. However, we also know that stress is how we as human beings learn new skills. When we have small stressors, it forces us to move and adapt what we're doing in order to be able to do more, to be able to gain new skills, to refine the skills that we have, to learn how to problem solve and so on and so forth. So we have a built-in stress response that helps us deal with mortal danger with, you know, if you're walking in the woods and you see a bear. We don't have a more complex stress response until we're older that helps us problem solve more complicated um, types of things. So kind of philosophically, you can think about three levels of stress response. Small amounts of stress, as I said, are actually a good thing, right? You have these little, little bits of heart rate increase, a little bit of stress hormone, but this is how you build new skills, okay? So nothing I say should be construed to think, oh, kids should have absolutely stress-free lives. Um, Honestly, they won't learn how to do anything if there's zero stress in their world. Then we have tolerable stress. These are more serious stressors, but they're temporary and they're buffered by supportive, nurturing relationships. Ah, yes, there's that relationships piece again. See how much it matters? And then you have what we call toxic stress. This may be the same level of stress as tolerable stress, but it's prolonged. It doesn't go away so easily and there's few or no protective relationships. And that's what makes it toxic. So you get this cyclical pattern that actually creates all sorts of problems. These childhood stressors that occur result in this fight or flight, or sometimes also known as fight, flight, or freeze response that's designed for dealing with when you're walking in the woods and you see a bear, okay? It becomes chronic because they're young. They don't have another more sophisticated stress response. So they pump out these stress hormones more. That causes some changes in the brain. It changes some of the centers that have to do with fear and safety and self-defense become more prominent. And the ones that are think there for long-term thinking, for uh, delayed gratification and so on, those actually uh, don't develop as well. But here's what we see. We see it in healthcare, we see it in education. Sadly, we see it in our correctional facilities ultimately. 
is a hyper responsive stress response. Kids aren't as calm. They can't cope as well because they're constantly scanning their environment. They're looking for danger. And that in turn feeds into more childhood stress. This leads to big problems for our school systems, for us in healthcare, for social services, for, for criminal justice, you, you name it. And this is the cycle that we, that we try to break by getting things right early on, because if we do it right early on, we can buffer against these stressors even where they do exist. We should, of course, be trying to reduce those stressors because of things like many of you may be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Abraham Maslow said, you need to do the things at the bottom of the pyramid, the more foundational things. If you don't have a home, if you don't have access, reliable access to food, um, shelter, safety, all those sorts of things, you can't be thinking about, oh, what am I gonna do with my career, right? That's, that's kind of hard when you're busy wondering about what's gonna happen hours from now, you know, let alone days or weeks or months, and certainly not years. So we need to think about how do we help stabilize the bottom part of that pyramid so that they can develop more complicated, complex, mature ways of coping with what the world has to throw at them. And of course, what can we do to reduce the fact that those stressors exist in the first place, right? No child should be homeless, right? We, 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 it shouldn't just be how do we make them more resilient, but also why in the world do we actually allow that to happen in the first place? So there's a few promising areas for thinking about uh, innovation in early brain and child development, as Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center on the Developing Child has said. We need to reduce the emotional and behavioral barriers to learning. There's lots of really smart kids out there with great intellects, and they have too many things layered on top that keep those intellects from really uh, doing amazing work. I sadly see a lot of them when I do work, clinical work at uh, our juvenile detention facility here in, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin smart kids, but clearly things didn't go so well, otherwise I wouldn't be seeing them in that setting. We need to recognize that children live in families and that we can't transform the lives of children if we don't transform the lives of their parents. And that's an important thing to recognize. And we need to reconceptualize that health and well-being is not just the job of health care. It's honestly everyone's job because clinical care only influences part of what makes a difference in their lives. What we call the social determinants of health play into so many different things, education, social and community context, the built environment, uh, economic stability, et cetera, et cetera. And let's remember there's a financial case to be made for this, even though it shouldn't be just about the money, that for every dollar we put into early childhood, four to nine dollars in returns. James, James, James Heckman at the University of Chicago, who's a Nobel laureate in economics, has clearly shown this work, as have some people at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve and in other analyses as well. And long before we have, we've had all these fancy analyses and brain scans and cortisol assays and so on, Frederick Douglass told us quite clearly, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So what can we do about solutions? We need solutions that do a number of things. We need to build capabilities. The parent who doesn't know or isn't sure or isn't confident in how to talk with their child, play with them, read with them, et cetera, how can we help build those capabilities? We can build capacities. The parent might know how to read to their child every night. They may want to do that, but they're working a second job because they don't make a living wage at their first job. Okay, how do we lift that burden from them so they can do the good job of parenting they know how to do and want to do and help them be able to do it? We need to do things that are based in homes and communities and not make people travel, address root causes, have good long-term effects, use a prevention mindset, leverage the first thousand days, Use an evidence-guided approach. You notice I don't say evidence-based. If you only do strictly evidence-based programs, you'll find that you keep doing the same things over and over. So we should also allow enough flexibility in our funding and other mechanisms to say, let's try some other things. Let's innovate and let's see what else we can do. And of course, continue doing the things that we have a strong evidence base for. And then we need to think about what can we take to scale? because we have some programs that are really wonderful and have great outcomes, but are very difficult to take a scale because of how resource intensive they are. Because the way I see it, there's really kind of a, a, a chain of events that has to happen. If you're gonna have productive, happy adults in our society, which I think we agree is probably a good overall goal, we need them to be educationally successful. Okay, how does that happen? Well, they need to have brain circuitry that's primed for that school success. 
That happens through, as we've just talked about, the early experiences that mold that brain to be for learning, social dialogue, et cetera. How does that happen? As we said, nurturing responsive interactions with children, and that relies on having adults who are able to put those sorts of skills into action and have the capability and capacity to interact well with children. And how does that happen? Ultimately, it comes back to the programs we set up, the policies we enact, and the advice we give. So how do we influence that? As I said, we could have these intensive but small initiatives. Home visiting are great examples, and they have great outcome data and so on, but they're also darn expensive, and it's really difficult to scale. And we can also have broader but scalable larger initiatives that are not going to have as large a shift, but that you can bring to broader elements of the population. I want to emphasize this is not saying we should do one or the other. This is part of an ecosystem of support and intervention and building skills throughout our community that all of these are necessary, but none on their own are sufficient. So this is not pitting them against each other. It's saying that they complement one another and are deeply necessary. And my colleague, Dr. Nate Chumala, will speak in just a moment to give an example of Reach Out and Read, which is one of those broader, scalable, larger initiatives. But before I turn it over to him, I just want to um, throw one more slide in that I almost always end with. Uh, this is my wife uh, reading to my son. Uh, this is years ago. He's uh, now a, a high school senior, so uh, clearly it's been some time. I caught them in this lovely moment of being lost in a book together, and it reminds me that children are made readers in the laps of their parents, and also that parents are their child's first and best teachers, and what we should do is how do we make sure parents feel confident in playing that role, comfortable in playing that role, and are able to do so every single day uh, possible with, with their child. So we'll have time for questions later, but again, if you follow on social media, feel free to connect with me there um, or email later on. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague in the state next door to me uh, in Minnesota, uh, Dr. Nate Chumolo, and I'll let the, my colleagues take it from there. All right, thank you, Depesh. So I'm Dr. Nate Chomo, uh, as uh, Depesh and um, Brian has acknowledged. I'm the medical director of Reach on Read Minnesota, and I'm happy to be here uh, and uh, to be a part of the CGLR webinar series. Uh, so I have the pleasure and privilege of talking about Reach on Read uh, and what our model is and uh, where what we've accomplished and where we're going. And so I think just to kind of recap for those who might have heard of Reach Out and Read before but aren't quite familiar with exactly what it is uh, we do, uh, our model is a one that has uh, been in place for 30 years. And it starts with uh, a provider, a book, and a child at the beginning of a well child check. When you get to take your children in to uh, get their shots, get their weight checked in those first five years, the provider starts the interaction with a book. Uh, and talks to the child uh, and models with the child uh, how uh, reading can work and uh, be part of the everyday routine uh, at, at that age. And it kind of leverages this uh, message, uh, trusted messenger uh, that providers and healthcare professionals are uh, in the families and communities that they serve. Uh, that uh, pairs that with a developmentally appropriate book. So uh, I often say when I'm talking about it, we're not giving you know one-year-olds uh, War and Peace, right? We're giving them uh, nice board books, uh, lots of uh, pictures of other babies, uh, uh, and talk about how it's different reading with a one-year-old versus reading with a three-year-old versus a five-year-old. And this is a, um, important because it meets families where they at. They don't have to go to uh, sign up for uh, this program with an application. They don't have to go to um, a different place. It's right there in the clinic, um, meeting them where they're at and where they're go already going. Uh, and this is a program that is evidence-guided and evidence-based. And so over 30 years, uh, it's been shown to increase parent engagement around reading 
um, uh, and how often children are read to, how often families rate reading as one of their favorite family activities. It has improved vocabulary scores in children who are served by Reach Out and Read clinics versus those who aren't. Uh, it decreases rates of speech delay and has even had some evidence of buffering against some of that toxic stress that uh, Dr. Nassaria touched upon. And as he also talked about, it's cost effective and scalable. And so we'll kind of examine that a little bit more. Uh, and so uh, it's our 30th anniversary, as Brian alluded to, uh, which is exciting. Um, and it's a, a moment for reflection and a moment to look forward. Um, uh, and it's kind of, a, for me, a kind of a, a, a interesting um, landmark because I would have just missed the first uh, uh, reach out and read program. I would have been six years of age when it came into being. And so, um, but we now have many people who have benefited um, over uh, the course of the program. And so we're looking at ways to continue that benefit and also deepen it. And so if we look at our model, um, some of the areas that Depeche talked about, um, and you know, I have kind of touched upon before, we really began to see that it's an ideal way to promote early relational health uh, using those books as tools. So uh, looking at that opportunity to uh, engage around early brain development during that critical window, um, looking at uh, how this can be something that is uh, a population level intervention with over 90% of children under the age of five seeing their physicians uh, at least once a year. Um, and how looking how it's something that is evidence-based right and so this is something that wasn't uh, just started and um, the social workers and pediatricians who started it felt like oh we're doing good in the world by putting books in there they, they went to the next level and they uh, have been studying it and continue to study it and its impact uh, and then it's uh, scalable right uh, it's feasible within the context of pediatric primary care um, and its uh, ability to uh, leverage that uh, existing healthcare system relationship um, and, and support through other affiliate infrastructures. Uh, the quote that actually Dr. Nafsaria uh, often says when he's talking about reach out and read that I like to, to share is, you know, give us a little, a little bit of money for some books and infrastructure and we'll throw in the doctors for free, right? And so that's that scalable intervention with that trusted messenger. And so you, know, you can see it's just that trusted messenger um, uh, that uh, is connecting with the family. Uh, it's a dose dependent intervention, meaning the more times the uh, family or the care providers, the parents are hearing about the importance of reading out loud, um, the more likely they are to change the behavior. And so within the healthcare system where children are going to see their uh, clinician or provider up to 10 times in those first several years, uh, it really, gives that unique capture opportunity even more effect. And so we have that micro level of uh, trust and engagement. We also have this macro level of uh, trust and engagement through our broad network and reach. And so uh, Reach on Read uh, engages with over 34,000 medical providers um, throughout the country. We work with over 6,400 medical clinics serving 4.8 million children and giving out 7.4 million books. And so really it is, again, if you think about physicians uh, and the trust that they have within the communities, uh, we're able to leverage that uh, across the country. And again, we're able to reach families where they are at. And so um, we're all across the, you can wanna go back just one side. We're all across the country. I really like this um, slide because it's uh, showing a heat map, if you will, of, of where Reach Out and Read clinics are. And you can see that there is um, a footprint in every state. Um, and so, but there's also opportunities for us to grow from that as well. So uh, it's uh, important to, for us to understand uh, the potential that we have as um, universal reach and primary prevention, uh, as Dr. Nafsaria talked about so well, uh, how we have this opportunity to engage early on. Um, but this is, and this is necessary, but it's often, you know, not sufficient. You know, just reach out and read alone isn't going to address all the needs that families have and uh, give them the strengths uh, and, and build on the strengths they already have. Um, but one thing that Reach Out and Read has done is really prioritize practices and clinics that serve uh, families and communities that have traditionally been under-resourced, right? 
70 percent of children um, served by reach on read nationally are uninsured or on public insurance like medicaid or chip um, our uh, percentage of uh, along racial lines um, kind of reflects um, some of those communities that have been traditionally under resourced and um, 22 percent speak a primary language other than English at home. And to kind of reflect that, we uh, have been able to provide books in over 22 languages to date. So in addition to uh, that focus on under-resourced communities, we have some, several initiatives um, uh, that uh, had to try to deepen the impact. Uh, and one of those first ones was uh, an initiative with uh, the military families were, um, worldwide and so uh, starting in 2006 there was an initiative to expand support to military families um, uh, working with uh, those who are on bases uh, active duty families as well as National Guard and reserve families um, uh, reaching thousands of children um, and, and civilian through civilian programs in the United States several other initiatives include um, more recently looking at uh, how we can engage with families whose children are um, dealing with developmental disabilities and how we can help train providers to engage with families uh, in those, some of those unique challenges they face. We've had a longstanding program in coordination with American Academy of Pediatrics and Indian Health Services um, to have an initiative focusing on providing Reach Out and Read to IHS and tribal and urban health clinics uh, nationwide, recognizing Again, how this is a community that's been traditionally under-resourced and, and therefore has some of the lowest uh, uh, test scores, high, high school graduation rates, college entry rates, and so it, this being a critical uh, population to reach out to. Uh, we also uh, know that 78% of Reach Out Read programs nationwide serve some families whose uh, primary language is Spanish, and so helping train our medical providers uh, to engage with uh, uh, families uh, in a linguistically appropriate way and also materials that are linguistically appropriate uh, for these families has been one of our main initiatives. So, um, in, you know, in addition to uh, these initiatives, um, the, the evidence uh, has really been there um, and shown with over a half dozen AEP policy statements specifically citing Reach Out and Read as a way to address, um, you know, many things like toxic stress, um, how you can uh, address families who are dealing uh, with children um, who have been maltreated or under, uh, experienced abuse, children struggling with and families struggling with poverty, uh, our immigrant families um, getting kids ready for school, things like how do we uh, deal with the ever rising use of screens and media in our children's lives, how do we deal with the diminishing uh, time that children get spent playing, um, even how the impact of racism um, uh, on child and adolescent health and how Reach Out and Read can be a way to help uh, introduce some of these concepts around uh, cultural pride reinforcement and uh, navigating difficult conversations about race and its impact on our health. And uh, really kind of um, culminated um, in 2014 with a policy statement talking about how literacy promotion was an essential component of uh, primary care pediatric practice uh, and specifically citing reach out and read as the model to use for primary care providers uh, across the country and then subsequently this was uh, integrated into the bright futures guidelines that pediatricians and primary care pediatric primary care providers use to, to guide the anticipatory guidance they give at these well child checks um, again citing reach out and read as the model for early literacy promotion so we have a lot to celebrate, but there's also a lot left to do. And so, you know, we're recognizing that helping families um, begin to sustain these patterns um, is complex and challenging. It can start with things like resources around reimbursement, and funding for uh, clinics and providers who are participating in Reach Out and Read and the, the cost of books, um, the resources as far as time. And so, make, you know, finding ways to uh, kind of demonstrate that this is a natural part of that early child, um, well child checkup uh, and how you could just integrate it seamlessly into things you're already doing. Uh, looking at education and training, right? So that primary care providers know about the importance of relational health and how to promote it with the reach out and read model. And then how do we work together? Uh, you know, with others also working with pediatric primary care providers to support all families. 
So um, our goal is the next chapter, as Brian introduced, is really how do we help shape the future of pediatric healthcare? And so our uh, vision is to reach out and read will maximize the potential of pediatric primary care to support positive interactions that foster healthy brain development during those critical early years of a child's life. So we have a strategy to approach this, a kind of several tiered strategy, uh, looking at uh, implementation of our existing model and new initiatives, things like training and relational health um, and our new initiatives, uh, things like policy design and advocacy to create an ecosystem that promotes early relational health uh, for all families via pediatric primary care, both by demonstrating the impact um, as well as uh, looking at scalability and fe feasibility and research. And then a convening, how do we uh, use this network we have, this connection to other um, uh, of the, our colleagues in the early childhood ecosystem to, to bring together leaders and influencers to achieve collective impact. So some examples um, of, of you know, first implementation is uh, a recent initiative uh, that is going throughout the country called Re Reach Out and Lead Counts. Um, and it's how do we embed early math concepts into the reach out and read model. Um, and so looking at ways that it doesn't have to be using specific math books, but are other ways that we can provide simple training, simple materials um, to have an impact on our early math and the evidence that exists that uh, early math skills can actually help improve and bolster early literacy skills and kind of better um, or even deepen the impact on academic success long term and so there's five states currently involved in this pilot program that uh, we hope then uh, bears evidence uh, to, to scale um, in a broader sense. And as we look at um, how do we uh, fund uh, early literacy promotion, um, there's been several uh, unique ways uh, Reach Out and Read uh, affiliates and chapters across the country have uh, obtained funding at the state level, um, whether it's through line item funding in the budgets, uh, competitive grant funding, looking at how do we fund early literacy uh, promotion, um, pairing with uh, Medicaid or CHIP uh, agencies to find ways to kind of support um, uh, those populations uh, getting access to reach out and read, or even through um, some uh, taxes uh, as ways to kind of, again, uh, create this ecosystem that is funded um, through state level interventions. And then how do we embed community um, uh, interactions and cross sector collaborations uh, into our model? And so in Minnesota, we've partnered with our uh, local children's museum on a pilot project to kind of connect families to the children's museum um, and the accesses that, that or the information they have around play and the importance of play um, in both in Minnesota and Chicago and many other uh, affiliates across the country have partnered with their local libraries um, and helped partner or sorry, help connect families and communities to their libraries uh, to continue that conversation that begins in the doctor's office. But again, realizing that it's not the end all be all, it's just the start of that conversation and what are ways that we can help connect our families to these other resources. And then looking at our, our research, and so um, in 2016, uh, there was the LitNet um, research network that was developed uh, to look at you know, not only early literacy, but how Reach Out and Read can help bolster pediatric primary care, looking at anticipatory guidance, even things like maternal care and clinician well-being. Um, and so really, again, knowing that it's not just early literacy, but uh, this is a really a tool to help really bolster all of pediatric primary care. Um, as far as training, uh, we uh, have some updated training videos that are freely available on YouTube. And so if you're interested in seeing uh, these, um, I really encourage you to check out Reach Out and Read's YouTube uh, channel um, and uh, looking at ways, what are, what are some other uh, areas of training that we could develop and kind of uh, then produce and help uh, distribute and have available for those who need it. And then lastly, the convening. Um, so. Uh, looking at, uh, you know, how do we continue to build upon our next chapter forum that Brian talked about that we held last month. Um, it was a really exciting event. I think there's lots of opportunity to continue to uh, bring together um, uh, leaders from across early childhood across the country, kind of find out ways that we can move together in a collaborative effort. So 
hopefully you can see from this that the reach out and read a network is an ideal infrastructure for implementing new training and new ideas, connecting and providing support um, to families with other community resources um, through our broad network that is only growing every day. And I, I'll just finish by saying, you know, I can't imagine practicing pediatrics without Reach Out and Read. Um, and really, it's our goal that Reach Out and Read is the standard of care throughout uh, the country and that we continue to strengthen the practice of um, pediatrics and the connections that families are having with their communities uh, through Reach Out and Read. So again, thanks for this opportunity. And I'll turn it over to uh, our, our colleagues. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Chomolo. Thank you, Dr. Navsaria. Um, I think you can all see how, um, just how honored we are every day at Reach Out and Read to work with such amazing advocates um, uh, for this work, um, what it means to them in their practice, uh, what it means for the families that are serving, um, and the joy that it brings to the, uh, that interaction. I think the pictures are worth a thousand words, um, but. Dr. Chomolo, Dr. Navsaria, thank you for grounding us in the work. Um, I think we started with a 30,000 foot view of kind of the, the broader um, challenges um, that we're trying to address. Um, uh, Dr. Chomolo then brought us to the 10,000 foot level to really think about one of those initiatives, Reach Out and Read, um, that does have this potential to scale. Um, and now I'm honored to um, introduce my colleague, Carolyn Mer Merrifield, who really give us a view um, at the ground level um, of how this program can work um, in partnership with communities across the, uh, the nation and some great examples there. Um, so thank you, Carolyn, for being here. Uh, Carolyn Merrifield has more than 12 years of experience with Reach Out and Read uh, in various capacities, including partnership development, communications and marketing, and program support. Before stepping into her current role as programs director, in which she's responsible for overall program strategy and quality implementation and data analysis for the two state region of the Carolinas region. Um, and we've also just added on uh, Virginia and DC to the work um, due to <coughs> um, momentum that's growing in the Carolinas. Um, Carolyn is also, has also served as the North Carolina programs manager. She was previously the communications manager at the Reach Out Read National Center in Boston. Carolyn holds a BS in mass communications from Boston University and sits on the leadership team for Wake Up and Read and the steering committee for Durham's campaign for grade level reading. And in her spare time, naturally she enjoys reading, also competing in triathlons and hiking with her dog, Porter. Um, and Carolyn also mentioned right before we started that she was just at an, at an event. Um, so in addition to this being Learning Tuesday, as many of you know, it's also Giving Tuesday. And so with that, Carolyn, I give you the mic. Thank you so much, Brian. And yes, happy Giving Tuesday to everyone. I hope you guys all have been taking advantage of the fa fantastic opportunity we all have to share our work with, uh, with the world at this point. So now that everyone has had a chance to learn about Reach Out and Read and our impact, I wanted to take this time to share a few success stories from across the country um, and, and talk about how campaign communities are really utilizing Reach Out and Read to help achieve their goals and ensure that children are on track for school success by third grade. So there are certainly more examples than I can share with you all today, um, but these, these highlights will at least help illustrate the ways in which Reach Out and Read can be part of those community level strategies. So I wanna first talk about why Reach Out and Read. Um, and as Nate and, and Depeche have mentioned earlier, um, Reach Out and Read really is unique because of that access and influence that we have. Um, our, our providers that work with families and children um, see those children, those children early and often. So we're able to build relationships with families. Um, more than 90% of children visit the doctor each year. So we really have in some ways a captive audience to talk about reading and the importance of, of incorporating reading into daily routines. Um, medical providers are also one of the top reported sources for parental guidance and families actually heed the advice that they hear from their child's doctor. So again, we know that reach out and read providers are those trusted sources for families. So additionally, um, you know, reach out and read providers talk with families about brain development and reading in ROR visits already. So I think the other opportunity that we have is that by having these conversations, parents are already primed to hear about other ways they can take that prescription for reading 
uh, beyond the exam room walls. So we can build upon that, those messages, we can build upon those conversations and share information about how families can access local resources. Um, and the one thing I wanna to mention too is that Reach Out and Read, it really is more than a book giveaway program. Um, Reach Out and Read, it's, the book is not a lollipop at the end of the visit. Um, Reach Out and Read trained providers, as you know, Nate mentioned earlier, really make book par books part of their toolkit and integrate Reach Out and Read into their standard of pediatric care. So the book is a tool for families and for providers. Um, providers use the books to assist with developmental surveillance and to support families in understanding developmental milestones for their children. Um, and the book becomes a tool for families, obviously, um, to activate that guidance and make reading part of their daily routine. So by talking about the importance of reading, by giving that age-appropriate guidance, um, and giving those tips, modeling for parents, reading techniques that are appropriate. Um, reach out and read providers, give families a true prescription for reading, not just a free book. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and I wanna just emphasize at our core, Reach Out and Read really encourages parents to read aloud daily to their young children as um, a simple and effective way of fostering, nurturing, language-rich family interactions that support brain development and provide a foundation for success. So Reach Out and Read, as we've talked about, is scalable, it's replicable, and it's research-based. So it makes, it makes us a natural partner for the work that campaign communities uh, are doing across the country. And we're a critical player in the integration of healthcare systems into those community collaborations. So I also wanna talk about some exact ways in which Reach Out and Read can support some of the campaign strategies happening across the country. Um, there's four kind of key areas I want to focus on for today, though certainly there are others, as we've mentioned. Um, really, you know, in thinking about the medical home as a hub for families, Reach Out and Read sites serve as critical access points for the integration of those strategies and foundations for um, layering of additional resources, services, and messaging. So um, when we're thinking about those opportunities for integration, um, these four kind of, these four key areas access to families, layering of services, development of physician advocates and scalability really are some of those, those key points. Um, so as we talked about, Reach Out and Read provides access to families um, and not just the children, the families, you know, the, the caregivers, the families, all of those um, folks who are coming to the visit to support that child um, are part of that Reach Out and Read visit. So Reach Out and Read helps parents build skills to support their children. Um, in some communities, Reach Out and Read is already serving tens of thousands of children and families, making us a near universal access point. Um, and that reach can really help campaign communities and other programs share messages, connect children and families with other services so they can take advantage of local resources. Um, and Reach Out and Read in that way also provides a natural opportunity, opportunity for layering of services. Um, Often the kind of work that's happening in campaign communities across the country um, really is an extension of our work and Reach Out and Read can serve as a foundation upon which to layer those programs and services. Um, the other piece I want to point out is that the medical providers who are involved with Reach Out and Read, like the two you heard from earlier, Nate and Depeche, who are two of our most tremendous champions, um, they're all incredible advocates for children and families and they can be true assets to your work. So the expertise that they bring to conversations about child development and public health can add a new perspective to the strategies. And their influence can actually extend to donors and legislators as well. So I would encourage all of you to get, get to know the, your Reach Out and Read champions in your community. Um, and campaign communities can engage with pediatricians as early literacy messengers in that way to support shared goals. Um, and I want to mention too, you know, as we've talked about, Reach Out and Read is a population-based, two-generational approach, and we have a pretty impressive scope, as, as we saw in the map earlier. Um, but there are still some places and opportunities to scale that. Um, so with, in, in communities without Reach Out and Read locations, um, we have the ability to grow Reach Out and Read to reach more children and families through, those, through the established structure of the healthcare system and really make sure that we are finding and, and meeting children and families where they are. So um, in thinking about those four categories, I wanted to share a few specific success stories from across the country. Um, and in thinking about that access, um, I wanna share some highlights um, first from Denver, Colorado. Um, 
So in Denver specifically, reach out and read partners with the Denver Preschool Project to um, essentially increase awareness of the Universal Pre-K program and some available tuition credits for kids. Um, so the Preschool Project actually provided some special books um, in addition to the regular reach out and read books that families received during their, their three and four year old well child visits. Um, and these books went out to 26 different uh, reach out and read sites in Denver. Um, on the books were stickers in English and Spanish that encouraged families to read together and attend preschool. Um, and it also provided um, some website and resource information for families to learn about payment credits, which was the, the big thing they were trying to push. Um, and so the initiative reached nearly 9,000 children and families, which is pretty impressive. Um, and this year, um, Reach Out and Read and the Denver Preschool Project are planning to um, actually take a little bit more targeted approach and really focus on the neighborhoods in Denver with the lowest pre-K enrollments to really um, highlight those, those families and neighborhoods specifically. Um, I also wanted to mention um, Newport, Rhode Island. So um, Newport's campaign actually spent a lot of time digging into the reasons for the reading inequities that they were seeing in their community um, and found, um, like many of us have, that attendance was one of the critical factors. So um, they were discovering that students were often missing school to stay home and take care of a younger sibling um, or because families didn't have access to transportation. So um, Kids Count and the Rhode Island Foundation actually got together um, and they partnered to fund books um, about going to school and those books were given out at Reach Out and Read visits. Um, there were titles like um, How Do Dinosaurs Go to School, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, and it included a, a bookmark that discussed the importance of school attendance. Um, it gave available resources, uh, which included actually a list of contacts for childcare and um, information about local transportation so they can specifically address those barriers in particular. Um, so I think those are two great examples of how that access can really benefit campaign communities um, and get that messaging out. Um, so next, in thinking about that layering of and braiding of services that we talked about, um, that you know, braiding really is one of the most natural ways that Reach Out and Read can support campaign work. Um, in Cincinnati, the Children's Hospital there, um, along with Every Child Capital and Cincinnati Public Schools, are actually um, working together to help build home libraries for young children. Um, so what they're doing is that um, when children come in for their Reach Out and Read visits at the hospital, um, CCH doctors prescribe books, they talk to families about the importance of reading as they would, as they do in all reach out and read visits. Um, and at that point, families are actually enrolled in Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. So those families are getting the message about the importance of reading, they're getting that guidance from providers in the exam room, and they get, then they get books in the mail to help reinforce that messaging. So the braiding of services here really helps ensure that kids have books in their homes, and um, the, the guidance really helps parents and caregivers understand how they can use those books in their daily lives. Um, and this partnership has actually been really successful. Um, they've seen measurable success in school readiness outcomes. And Cincinnati Public Schools are actually now funding the joint partnership to continue seeing those gains down the line. So that's been really exciting. Um, I also want to give a shout out to North Carolina, since I am here in North Carolina. Um, across the state, we have been fortunate enough to have um, a number of our Reach Out Made locations serve as essentially clearing houses of information for children and families. Um, many, <clears throat> many counties are using uh, Reach Out Read waiting rooms to provide information and resources like postcards about room, um, flyers about library hours, um, and other materials to share messages about the services happening in those communities. Um, additionally, clinics here in Wake County are helping to enroll families in the Wake Up and Reads Ready for K program, which is a text messaging service. Um, and additionally, they're also in helping enroll families in um, Imagination Library as well. So again, all of, those, all of those additional pieces are helping reinforce that message that providers are giving. Um, and you know, we're also getting out uh, information about uh, and ma maps to local libraries, um, information about bus routes to get to the library, um, and special uh, play times at, at the local uh, children's museum here in Raleigh. So lots of lots of great ways to layer on those additional services and information. Um, so like we like I mentioned earlier, using reach out and read physicians as your advocates can be one of the best ways that you can you can have reach out and read get involved in your communities. 
Um, and campaigns can really utilize the voice and elevate providers into that role as early literacy um, champion in, in community conversations. Um, I want to highlight um, Get Georgia Reading. Um, they are really a fantastic example of how communities can utilize ROR to grow their network of advocates and champions. Uh, Reach Out and Read Georgia was one of the inaugural partners in the Get Georgia Reading campaign, which is actually the largest state network of campaign communities in the country right now. They have 100 communities in 94 of, their, of the counties, which is a pretty impressive scope, I will say, Reach Out and Read Georgia and uh, Get Georgia Reading. Um, so Reach Out and Read Georgia has actually made, um, has aligned their efforts with the Get Georgia Reading campaign in, in, their, in their strategic priorities at the state level. Um, and Reach Out and Read providers and staff are part of cabinets, they're part of leadership com committees and involved in much of the work happening at the community level. Um, one county I wanna highlight specifically is uh, Muskogee County. Um, the Let's Get Muskogee, Let's Read Muskogee campaign um, recently included a literacy forum um, as part of their first child wellness summit. Um, in that summit, participants received training on the links between literacy and child development um, and mental health topics, and attendees included home visitors, mental health providers, social service providers, educators, and parents. Um, and the Reach Out and Read Georgia medical director, Dr. Carrie McFadden, led the summit and opened with a keynote. So that's, I think Georgia has so many great examples of ways in which they're really, um, you know, using Reach Out and Read champions to help advocate for the work happening um, in those campaign communities. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the folks in Iowa who are also doing a fantastic job with this work. Um, one of Iowa's literacy champions recently said it best, which is um, a credible articulate position is a terrific asset in communicating the relationship between Reach Out and Read and the campaign. Um, and I could not agree more. I think that could, that statement essentially says it all. But um, in Iowa, the Reach Out and Read providers are actually helping to advocate for community partnership at local, state, and national gatherings. Um, the Reach Out and Read Iowa leadership team have made it a priority to partner with campaign communities throughout the state. So there are a number of different places where they're all working together and involved. Um, and Reach Out and Read Iowa's medical director is often presents um, and hosts trainings at campaign meetings local events and national conferences. So they really have a, a very tight partnership um, and that's, that, that alignment has really served to um, help, help the success of those campaigns in Iowa. So I want to just talk briefly about um, scalability. Um, as we've talked about, Reach Out and Read is a, is a very scalable program. We have that ability to be a population-based um, model. And so one of the, the highlights I wanted to, to, to show um, in that regard is Read Charlotte, which is one of the communities here in North Carolina. Um, so Reach Out and Read itself can actually be one of the strategies that, that communities can use to reach more children and families. Um, and Read Charlotte is impressive, not only because it's helped, they've helped us scale our work in Mecklenburg County, um, but also because they really encompass in all of the pieces that they're doing, um, that work really encompasses all of the topics we've talked about today. So um, Read Charlotte's investment centers around Reach Out and Read Serving um, essentially is a foundational piece of the community strategy um, and larger community tapestry there. So um, we're engaging population-based levels of families through the trust and touch point of the medical home, um, as we've talked about. And um, this partnership really has, it's manifested in a few specific ways. Um, you know, first around the targeted expansion of Reach Out and Read locations in neighborhoods and zip codes that Read Charlotte has identified as their highest, their highest need and their, their, the, way, the areas they want to impact the most. Um, we've had a layering of messaging. We've um, had, you know, as we talked about, we have Ready for K, we have other programs, we have DPIL, we have other um, programs and, and resources that are being layered on in those Reach Out and Read clinics in Charlotte. Um, and we also have, um, which I think is one of the most important things, engagement and conversation with some of the key healthcare and community leaders. Um, Reed Charlotte has actually helped us, you know, make some inroads with some of the major healthcare organizations and make sure that Reach Out and Read and the healthcare systems themselves are part of the solution at that community level. So um, it really has, it's helped us um, grow, our our, grow our footprint in Charlotte. We currently have um, 30 active sites in Charlotte alone. Um, 17 of which were added since the start of the Reach Out and Read, Read Charlotte partnership. And we have 11 more in the queue right now. 
Um, and so with that, reach out and read providers have done more than 127,000 well child visits, and we've doubled the, our impact in, in Charlotte. Um, so, and I want to point out to you, joint fundraising efforts, it, it hasn't just been about providing books during those visits. Like we've talked about, you know, Reach Out and Read is not just a book giveaway program. So Read Charlotte has really helped to um, provide funding and, and help us uh, coordinate funding efforts around um, provider training so that we can help providers understand how to better integrate Reach Out and Read as a strategy in those well visits and um, talk about some of the pieces um, that we've addressed earlier, relational health, toxic stress, resiliency. Um, and it's, it's really helps provide infrastructure for Reach Out and Read's high quality scaling and implementation in the community. Um, so beyond the Read Charlotte example, I also do wanna give a shout out to you know, folks in Iowa and Georgia get, again, who have also elected to help fund a high quality expansion of Reach Out and Read in their, in their states and communities um, by providing book support and some of that infrastructure to support, support to make sure that Reach Out and Read happens at that high quality level. So I want to, um, those are again, just a few examples. I could, I could honestly talk to y'all for hours about all the great things happening with Reach Out and Read and campaign communities across the country. Um, but I, I wanna leave you with some, um, some contact information for Reach Out and Read. Um, as we've mentioned, Reach Out and Read has more than 6,400 locations in the US. Um, and we we're in all 50 states. We are in urban, rural, and suburban communities. So there are likely opportunities for partnership with Reach Out and Read in your community already. Um, and so I do want to, if you're looking for more information about where to find Reach Out and Read near you, um, you these links will take you to our website that has a you know, wealth of information about you know, where Reach Out and Read is currently happening. Um, many states do have Reach Out and Read affiliate offices, which are the, the statewide or the regional offices that work directly with our program sites to ensure the, you know, the effective implementation of Reach Out and Read. Um, and if, if, you do, if you do have an affiliate office in your state, I encourage you to get in touch with your affiliate leaders. They can connect you with the medical providers in your area. They can help lead some of that statewide strategic work. Um, and they can also share information that you might have um, among our network of providers. Um, and so I will say too, if there is not a Reach Out and Read affiliate office in your state, which I know is obviously the case for a few folks, um, there are still engaged and excited Reach Out and Read champions in your community. Um, you can go onto our website and find um, Reach Out and Read near you, and we can help you get in touch with those doctors to think about how to, how to build these partnerships and grow. Um, so please do be in touch. We want to hear from y'all. And again, we're so thrilled to have the partnership with campaigns. Um, the work that y'all are doing really amplifies what we are doing in so many ways and is, is really a, a natural marriage, a natural partnership um, for all of us. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and um, special thanks to Depeche and Nate as well um, for grounding us in the science and looking at the national network of Reach Out and Read. I was um, imagining what that map would look like with our uh, grade level reading stars on top of it as well. I think we have to do that, do an overlay at some point. Um, and then to um, have the very real experiences from um, communities across the network is, is so very helpful. Um, if, if you haven't figured out already, you can see why we um, put this webinar together and how closely aligned um, the work around early relational health, um, supporting parents, um, the incredibly important role of healthcare providers are in, in children's healthy development. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thrilled that we've been able to have these folks make time to be with us today. We have a couple of uh, great questions that have been coming in um, around, um, specifically around how to engage health partners, how to engage individual practices, especially when um, um, physicians and, and mid-level practitioners are, are stretched thin and have limited time to see patients. Um, Dr. Nisvari, I, I uh, saw that you were ready and willing to jump into um, some conversation around that specific. So I'm gonna ask you to um, step forward here and, and share a little bit about your own thinking. Great, thank you. Um, and, and thank you to my colleagues. And, and I just want to highlight, um, I, I think it probably came out in Carolyn's talk, but um, 
so much of the excellent work of Read, Chat, and Read is, is due to the amazing staff we have both at National Center and the affiliates throughout the country who are really helping clinics um, in that frontline work that's so necessary to be able to implement Read, Chat, and Read in a high quality way uh, in accordance with our evidence base. So um, I think a lot of that came out in the um, great examples that she provided. And uh, she's a great example of, of exactly why this work is so successful because uh, we can't rely on uh, you know small slivers of uh, busy doctor's time alone. I think you put the doctors together with that support and it really works well. Um, to the questions that were brought up, um, I'll say a couple of things. So uh, we did a small qualitative study, it's small, um, of providers in Wisconsin uh, who had not yet implemented Reach Out and Read, but were um, in application to do so, and then compared them with folks who had been doing Reach Out and Read for at least a year, if not longer. Um, and that study is uh, in, in publication. It hasn't been published yet, but it's been accepted. So um, uh, hopefully in the next six months or so, once the journal uh, queues it up for publication. We found that those who had not yet implemented Reach Out and Read were concerned about a number of things, including funding for books, but also about the time to be able to adequately do the intervention within well child visits. Not a single one of the clinics that had been doing Reach Out and Read said time was an issue. They actually said it helped them do their job better, easier, faster, and higher quality. Um, so uh, it, they said, yeah, this is, this is actually just fine. To the other question that, that was asked, which is related to this, is uh, yes, we unfortunately live in a for-profit healthcare system, and um, the more patients that get packed into time, the, the more revenue there is for the systems. One, I think systems need to, uh, people need to recognize that um, that's not necessarily the choice of the individual practitioners in the system. Um, that's something that we're increasingly being told to do. Uh, but number two is that we should think about ways to work to change that system. Uh, as much as there's been talk about, you know, outcomes-based or value-based payments and so on, what we're still largely seeing is um, a, a volume mod model of care. So I think especially when you are well-known in the community as, a, as an organization that cares about children and families, um, leaning on the healthcare systems and saying to them, you know, um, what are you doing to ensure that one, your healthcare practitioners are able to adequately spend the time doing this? Um, one of the questioners um, uh, used a word that I've been thinking about a lot lately and, and doing a little bit of writing and speaking about, which is how do you build trust? Um, and I could certainly go on for an hour about that, but won't. But I think saying that, you know, we can't, because we, there's so much focus on what we can measure that we sometimes leave out the most important things that are foundational to the healthcare um, interaction like trust. So I would uh, encourage you to bring those things up. And if you can be an ally to the healthcare practitioners who are feeling, frankly, increasingly distressed in many communities throughout the country about how little time they are to getting to engage with children and families, one, you will help them, which helps children and families. And number two, is that honestly, um, they will be more willing to listen to, okay, what is it that you're trying to bring to them and, uh, and, and help kind of pull everything together there. So I could say much more on that, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that at that. Those are excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you, Depesh. Um, any of our other presenters have a response to those questions? Yeah. Um... That's a question that I get uh, all the time when I'm talking about Reach Out and Read, whether it's to providers, healthcare system, executives, um, other community agencies. And, um, you know, one of the things I point out is that if you look at the training videos, a lot of them are like 30 seconds, a minute, you know, at most. And it really shows how you quickly you can use the, the intervention and the model to build that rapport and that trust. Um, you know, children, you, you can point out how scared that they can be going to the doctors and how this really helps kind of put them at ease, put the parents at ease um, in a way that, you know, no other tool that we're really bringing in does. And then if you look at the evidence, is the other arguments you can say is there's evidence that uh, providers that participate in Reach and Read um, are more satisfied with their practice. And so there's a lot of talk about burnout and um, how do we help uh, providers who are feeling the stress of these time pressures um, and really reach out and read uh, uh, is an 
model that helps providers actually feel like they're connecting with their patients and helping them both here in the clinic and beyond. And then there's evidence uh, when you look at the patient side that uh, the parents of uh, children who are served by Reach Out and Read are more satisfied with their pediatric provider, right? And so, in the, again, uh, if you want to look at the demands on providers' times and the demands on systems, they're really looking at these patient satisfaction scores. Um, and, and so looking at Reach Out and Read as a way to help again, um, build not only the provider's uh, satisfaction, but the parent's satisfaction uh, are some of the, uh, the arguments and, and the benefits of this model when you're trying to kind of frame it in how do you fill in with one more thing to do. Thanks, thanks, Nate. Carolyn, anything, do you have any response? I just, I wanna echo exactly what um, Depeche and Nate have said. I think that is, is so true um, and I think you know, not being a physician, but working with so many of our doctors across the Carolinas and in Virginia, um, I think they would say exactly what, what Nate and Depeche have also said. Um, you know, we know that, yes, there may only be seven to 15 minutes that the doctors are able to spend with families in those visits. Um, and certainly reach out and read alone is not going to change the entire system of healthcare. But we can start to make progress, you know, by having that book, by having that warm interaction with families, it begins to build those relationships more than, than not having it would. So I think that, um, you know, we see that, that providers are more engaged. There's, there's less burnout, as Nate was saying. We see that families are more engaged with their, with their, with their doctors and with their clinics as a result. So um, it may not be changing the world all in one fell swoop, but I think we are definitely seeing progress in that regard. And that's certainly not something to be discounted. Um, and I do think it's important to note that when Reach Out and Read is done well, when the writers are trained in how they can integrate Reach Out and Read into their visits, when they take those trainings online that Nate referenced, we can really show them how to make Reach Out and Read part of their standard of care so that it isn't something else on that checklist, so that it helps them achieve all of the goals of the, of the conversations they're having already. You know, rather than having to go through an ASQ and, and look at, you know, is the child able to hold scissors and go through the, the entire checklist, a doctor can hand a book to a child and they're very, when they walk in the door and watch what happens. You can ask questions about, you know, what color is Clifford? What color is the tree? How many monkeys are jumping on the bed? And get a sense for what is happening in that child's life, perhaps more than you would with one of those screeners. So um, I think it can really, when it's done well, I think it can really be a tool to help those visits be more efficient, to build positive relationships, um, and to really, uh, you know, achieve some of those goals that we're all helping, hoping to see. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question um, specifically about engaging healthcare systems um, to, to come to the table for these kind of collective impact um, efforts. And uh, in, in a former uh, part of my career, I, I was a healthcare executive actually charged with um, the community engagement uh, work for a, a not-for-profit health system. And in, in every health system, there should be someone, either a, a community benefit officer, it might be um, someone charged with um, external and governmental relations. So there's, there's an individual um, that would be a, an important point of contact. And a lot of pediatric practices are part of larger health care systems. So rather than trying to start with an individual practice, sometimes it works to get to that person who's, who's the community benefit officer or uh, for, for a given health system. Um, and so I would highly recommend that you start there if you're, if you're struggling um, at, in your local community. Uh, we've had a couple more questions come in around funding um, and this, this notion of um, funding not being available um, or dropping off. Um, uh, Brian, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask you to speak to this one, but what, how do we make the case to funders um, that this is a, a, a critical issue uh, for investment? Um, sure, I think we start with um, a lot of the points that were made around um, Number one, the um, the the cost effectiveness of the model, um, the evidence based nature that we know this works, um, that we're exist that we're leveraging existing infrastructure, um, and that we can really reach a whole um, population of children in any given community through the um, through the through this platform, pediatric um, 
providers, family physicians, really anywhere that children are going, um, they're already there. I think you know our focus, as we talked about in the model, um, is really starting in those early weeks, months of life. Um, and where else can we reach uh, that number of children um, and their families, most importantly, their families um, during that, um, those first three years of life? Um, it's where they're going to see the, the provider. Um, so we know we're an entryway into um, those initial conversations, really a preventative um, measure of engaging families early and often in a cost-effective way, leveraging uh, trusted advisors, professionals, oftentimes these families, the families that are coming in, um, the pediatrician, the family physician may be um, the one professional trained in child development, um, providing guidance, um, coaching, really that positive parenting support um, that's needed in those first days of life, but also contextualizing it into um, you know, where the family is, you know, uh, Dr. Tomolo talked about really meeting the families where they are. Um, certainly that ha that's, that's in the physical location, but um, really more importantly, um, understanding the broader context of um, what supports are needed for those families. Um, and then from there, there can be a much um, more robust um, uh, intervention for families that really need additional supports. Um, but from a, an entry point, uh, starting a conversation, um, we can reach children and, the, and their parents um, in those early years um, at a relatively much lower cost than, than any other program. Good, thank you. Um, we've had another question come in about um, addressing uh, uh, adult literacy. Uh, and uh, Nate and, and um, Depeche, perhaps you could speak to how, how do you work with um, families where the adults um, have low literacy levels? Uh, how, how do you work with families in the context of a pediatric visit? And Carolyn, then if there are any specific strategies happening at the community level, we'd love to hear those as well. Sure, um, so that's a common question. Uh, particularly when you're talking about reading. Um, how do you uh, work if you are concerned that the parents or caregivers themselves don't know how to read? And um, when you go through the training, you find one of the things that we uh, discuss and, and promote is really talking about using the book as just a prompt to have a conversation. And so it's not necessarily reading the words on the page, but describing the pictures and talking about it and maybe not even going with the flow of the story, but tying it back to the child's life. You know, when is the last time you saw a dog in the park? Or when's the last time, you know, we went grocery shopping and found watermelons? You know, so kind of having more of a conversation around the book can cut through some of uh, that and modeling that when you are giving the, the book to the child, not just um, expecting uh, the parent to know that that's one of the ways that they can interact with the book. Uh, and then, you know, some of our higher performing clinics do help connect uh, families um, connect parents or caregivers who struggle with literacy with adult literacy classes, whether it's through local libraries or other literacy uh, training hotlines. And so that's one of the ways we um, uh, try to connect families and caregivers that might struggle with literacy themselves. Thank you. I'd, I'd say that um, with any anything that we do in healthcare, right? If you're not able to handle it directly in your clinic, we refer out and we use that same kind of idea and model that when uh, in Wisconsin, I know for sure that our, um, our staff, when we work with clinics that are setting up Reach Out and Read, we ask them, do you know who your local adult and family literacy providers are? And if they don't, we help them find that information. No one is saying that um, pediatric offices need to get into the business of dealing with adult literacy uh, directly, but recognizing that it has an impact on uh, not just the parent, but also the child and the whole family. Um, can we refer them to the appropriate resources that exist out there? Good, thank you. That's, that's great preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, any, um, any specific um, models or strategies that you're aware of in terms of two-gen literacy models? Uh, yes, and actually, um, you know, Depeche just kind of referenced, but um, I think, you know, the beauty in, in having Reach Out and Read serve as an access point in many of these campaign communities is that you can begin to at least discuss some of those topics like adult literacy issues that can sometimes be a little bit, a little bit difficult. Um, you know, obviously, like, we're not expecting pediatricians to 
identify those issues and, and help adults learn how to read necessarily. But if we have other information about services, if we have that information about local libraries and other things that are happening, that making that adult literacy referral can be less painful. Um, it can be less embarrassing. Hopefully by building those relationships with families, that conversation can be a little bit easier to have. Um, so I think in a number of communities in North Carolina here, we actually are connecting families with, with adult resources, whether it's through programs like Mother Read or um, through some of the family connection services. Um, I know in places like Guilford County, North Carolina, they have some really robust programs that actually um, teach adults how to read. And so our clinics can, can help make that referral in uh, you know, a more comfortable way for families. Thank you. I think we are about at the end of our questions that have come in. Does anyone else have anything out there, anything you're curious about that you haven't had a chance to ask yet? You can see the survey is up um, while you're pondering. Any last questions? Um, we really appreciate you taking a moment to just answer those um, few questions. They help us uh, uh, improve on each webinar. And seeing nothing else come in, I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to say thank you, um, to, to especially say thank you to Brian um, uh, at Reach Out and Read, um, uh, just a critical national partner um, with the campaign. We're, we're willing and ready to sort of jump into this conversation around um, early relational health with you all um, to our presenters. Um, Dr. Depeche, Dr. Nate, and Carolyn, um, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy days to be with us. Um, we're um, really excited that you were able to make it today. Um, and I see a, one final question that just popped in. Well, I, we've got a couple minutes. Um, measuring impact. Um, do we have resources that we can point people to around that? We'll find those and get those out. Um, I want to just um, uh, take your attention to the final slide here with the partner webinars that are coming up. Um, and you can, when you register, you can select all the webinars that you want to be part of and you'll get those links even if you're not able to join us um, today. Uh, so with that, um, I think we are near the bottom of the hour and we will sign off. Thank you so much to everyone.